Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for making natural sunscreen with the Bee Chicas. You'll be able to see the ingredients and recipes on the beechicas.com slash how-to website. We'll post that in the chat. I'm Kathy Lane, Programs, Events, and Outreach Coordinator with the Boulder Public Library. Celine Cooper is behind the scenes running the live stream. And before I introduce the Bee Chicas, I want to go over some housekeeping. First, this event is being recorded and will be available on Boulder Public Library's YouTube channel after today. All of our online events are extensions of library services, so library conduct policies apply in our online space. If you enjoy this presentation, we have more upcoming virtual programs. Please visit our website at boulderlibrary.org for our full events calendar. This event is part of our Summer of Discovery, the annual celebration of reading and virtual programs for teens, kids, and adults. And you can visit boulderlibrary.org slash summer to register. The last day to pick up prizes is August 31st at the main library. So I'd like to thank the Boulder Library Foundation for its generous sponsorship of this and many of our events. At any time during this event, you can post your questions in the chat. You can log into your Google, YouTube, or Facebook account to post questions depending on what platform you're, you're sharing with us. Your questions will be addressed later during the audience Q&A portions of the event. Boulder Public Library and the City of Boulder have been working with the Bee Chicas since 2015 for seat to table workshops and they take care of our amazing beehives on the roof. So we have Tracy, Teresa, Deborah, and Cynthia. They are scientists, artists, gardeners, and amazing beekeepers and educators who are passionate about pollinators and bringing more education about how we can take care of ourselves, the earth, and pollinators. And we're grateful, Bee Chicas, for adapting the in-person workshops you would have been offering to a virtual experience. Over to you, Bee Chicas. <laughs> okay, thanks, Kathy. So I'm gonna pull up my slides here and um, Hopefully you can see, yes. Okay, so um, there we are on the roof of the library with Cynthia waving in our bee suits. And um, here's just one of our favorite bee photos just showing you uh, guard bees protecting the entrance of their hive. And here we are at the live bee or in-person Bee Boulder Festival from many years ago. And um, now we all dress like Teresa in a yellow and black striped bee suit. <laughs> and um, we hope you join us this September 12th virtually because we have so much more information that's gonna be fun and exciting and available to, to so many more people. Um, and there, Kathy mentioned the beehives on the roof of the library. You can actually see these when you're walking um, from Seeds Cafe over to the Canyonside Gallery. And one of the amazing things that we'd like to um, tell people about is that there are so many species of bees, bees. If you combine bees and wasps, there's more species than plants even. So um, in Boulder County, we have about almost 600 different species, but honeybees aren't native. So they were brought over from Europe um, with um, European crops in the 1600s and then have spread and are very much an important part of our agricultural system now. So um, you can join us next month to learn more about native bees and um, just the diversity and their habits and also learn how to catch and identify and tell the difference between like a honeybee and a native bee and a wasp, which you know can look very similar. This is a native bee that might look like a wasp to you here as well. So mm -hmm. it'll be September 16th at 4 p.m. and you can sign up on the um, on our um, Boulder Library events page. Just search for Bee Chicas. And so, but today we're talking about bees and honeybees and um, why they are so special. It's because they are probably the only insect that produces wax in abundance or produces their own building material. And um, it's, a, it's a product that we all used um, for first for candles um, and the only light that we had in 3000 BC. So um, it was very special to all of us then. And now it's more used in like snobs and lotions and, and nice candles. So um, they're, 
building material looks like um, looks like paper coming out of a fax machine. It's um, <laughs> these wax glands in their abdomen, and you can see it's not very really much that they could be. It's um, one single bee makes one one hundredth of a teaspoon of wax in her whole life. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine why a pound of beeswax is so expensive. And when we harvest from our hives, um, uh, you know, the end of summer right now, we might harvest 100 pounds of honey, but we'll only get one or two pounds of wax. So um, it takes about an energy equivalent of seven or 10 pounds of honey for a honeybee to produce one pound of wax. So, um, so it's very precious. And here you can just see how um, the honeybee nest might look like in a tree on the left here. Um, and this is all wax comb that they have built from their own bodies. And then here you can see us on the roof of the library holding up a frame that looks like a honey frame. Um, you can see there's some open nectar here and then all this is capped with wax honey. So, um, in order to have wax production in a beehive, it usually mostly happens at the beginning of spring through midsummer. But right now, the bees are not making any wax at all. All they're doing is putting up honey stores for their for their winter heat or fuel source. So um, you need to have a nectar flow uh, and flowers blooming to to um, for the bees to actually start building wax. So plants and flowers, here's some good ones here that we like, um, but we have lists on our website at beechicas.com of what, what flowers and na especially natives that we recommend um, for bees. So I'm gonna pass the torch over to Deborah. And oh wait, any questions at all? Well, no questions, I'll jump in and start talking about what we do with wax. And Tracy already mentioned some of these incredible products that we're all used to seeing and using. Um, lots of cosmetics and first aid products like ointments and salves, of course, use beeswax. And uh, the beautiful fully full beeswax candles, um, some more unusual ways to use it that a lot of people might not not realize is weatherproofing, waterproofing outdoor gear and sealing leather. Um, another easy household use of it is unsticking drawers or zippers. If you've got a little chunk of beeswax, you can rub it on a, a sticky drawer or a zipper and lubricate it so it operates a little bit better. So there are literally dozens of ways to use beeswax. And one of our favorites, of course, are the beeswax wraps. Um, we love and are very committed to eliminating single use plastic from our lives. And we've had several beeswax wraps workshops um, at the library and in other places. And it's such an easy, simple way to introduce something to your daily use that really makes a difference. So join our next beeswax wrap workshop for sure. So how do we get wax from the hive? As Tracy mentioned, it is such a precious commodity. We use every little bit and piece that comes out of our hives. Um, the picture on the left shows a honey harvest actually. And those are cappings that we screen out when we filter the honey and uh, we let the bees clean up the little last remaining bits of honey off of those. And then we can put them in a solar wax melter, which is the photo in the center. And a solar wax melter is something many of us use to render our wax. So we can put pieces of broken comb in there or any scrapings from hive inspections or honey harvest, and we place it right on that metal tray and the lid has a clear top. So the sun will heat up that metal and do all the work for us. Literally, all we have to do is put it outside in the sun. So that melted beeswax flows down off of that tray, which is at a slight angle, and it runs into a glass dish that we fill with water. 
And when that wax hardens, you get the photo on the right, which is a beautiful block of rendered beeswax that smells incredible and looks incredible. And then we can um, use that for all the different products we make. And we put wax actually back in the hives by making foundation strips for the bees to draw down frames. And then of course, for the wraps and the lip balms and all the other products. So why bother making homemade sunscreen? Um, I think the headline says it all. It, I think you would be shocked to know that there are little to no regulations when it comes to labeling beauty products. Some companies will put in a very small percentage of an ingredient and then label it natural or safe, which is very misleading. I became really interested in this topic last winter when I watched a documentary called Toxic Beauty. And it was a movie that was um, offered at the film festival. And it was, it was really mind blowing to see the sheer amount of toxic chemicals being used in beauty products from makeup to body products to shampoos. And the movie really highlighted the lack of oversight in the whole industry and the need for safer options. And I would really encourage you, I think it's available to, screen, to stream and I would really encourage you to look it up and watch it. I think you, you will be even more motivated to make sunscreen. Um, the other reason is for the environment. Obviously, if these ingredients are harmful to us, they're not doing any favors to the environment. And in fact, coral reefs are very threatened by many of the ingredients in commercial sunscreens. And it's estimated that 5,000 metric tons wash off of swimmers each year and many parts of the world, they've banned certain sunscreen ingredients completely because of the negative effects on coral reefs. And then lastly, it can be much more cost effective. You know, Therese is gonna speak to some of the costs around the ingredients and the different oils, but mainly after you make your initial investment, many of those will make multiple batches and it, and it can be very cost effective to make your own. Next slide. Um, there were a lot of recipes for homemade sunscreens when I started looking into this. And we wanted to feature some of the most common base ingredients that are used. So let's start with SPF. What is SPF? It stands for sun protection factor. And it's a measure of how long a product will protect you from damage by UVB rays. And those are the kind of rays that cause sunburn. So there are UVB and UVA, but primarily we're concerned with UVB, which is um, sun, sunburn rays. Um, so we're highlighting each of these ingredients to show you that on their own, they each kind of have a slight SPF factor. And it's important to note that it's the combination of these ingredients that is going to provide you with protection. For instance, you shouldn't expect to rub a little shea butter on your skin and have any sun protection at all. The most important ingredient on this whole list would be, for my recipe, zinc oxide, and I think there's some other recipes they're doing that include um, titanium dioxide. That is absolutely the most important, or those two, or a combination of the two, would be the most important ingredients that you should use. And that's because they provide that broad spectrum protection. So basically they, zinc oxide or titanium dioxide will scatter the sun's rays so that the UVB rays can't come into direct contact with your skin. And that's what provides such a strong um, sunburn factor. And then the other oils and the other ingredients um, heighten that protection. But as base ingredients, those two would, would be the most important. And it also is worth noting that unlike commercial sunscreens that are tested in a lab, 
and have verified SPF factor, homemade suns sunscreens don't. And it's, a, it's an estimation of SPF and we strongly encourage you to use caution and test individual recipes for yourself. You may need to adjust the ingredients. You may need to add more or less of certain things for your skin types. And so play around, play around and see what you like in terms of consistency and be mindful out in the sun and track what works best on your own skin. And this is a recipe that I um, looked up and modified and have been using. It's a salve-based recipe using beeswax. And beeswax is the ingredient that adds more water resistance. So a salve-based recipe will typically be a little bit more water resistant than a lotion-based recipe. And it's also um, thicker. It hardens in a, it, it cools in a hardened state. So it doesn't rub in like a lotion. I really like this recipe. It's very simple to make and it has ingredients that are easy to find and um, comes together quickly. So I think Tracy has a little video she can show us of a time-lapse video putting this together, but you basically take the top ingredients of the shea butter and the coconut oil and the vitamin E and put it in a heat-proof measuring cup in a pot of simmering water and add the beeswax a little bit at a time just until it's all melted together and you take it off the heat and then you add your zinc oxide and your raspberry seed oil and pour it into a container, either a paper tube for an easy application or a jar, and you're good to go. So it does require a tiny little bit of, of stovetop action, but other than that, it's, it's a quick 10 minute recipe and it feels great. It has a very nice creamy texture it and sets up firm, but when you put it on your skin, it melts very quickly and it starts out a little oily, but then it absorbs really quickly and it actually feels very moisturizing. That oily feeling goes away, at least for me, because mm -hmm. I have very dry skin. So it's a good recipe for that. I forgot to, or I meant to ask which, what, which oils were optional in our in this recipe. This um, recipe has the optional raspberry seed oil. And I, I always put it in because it adds a pretty significant boost to your SPF factor. It's a little expensive, but this recipe in particular takes eight drops. So a one ounce bottle is going to last for many, many batches. So it's a little bit of an initial investment, but it totally pays off in terms of the added protection for sun. Okay. And a one ounce bottle is like $5. Exactly. Yeah. And we can buy it locally. So it's really nice if you don't have to mail order it. It's, it's not, you know, it's really not too bad. And all the other ingredients I got at the grocery store. So I, did, I only had to make a separate trip for the raspberry seed oil. And well, of course I have beeswax on hand. So you may have to grab that as well. So should we so, tell our source uh, where we purchased the zinc oxide powder? And the oh, let me add one more thing. I meant to add a uh, protection level in this. And in the original recipe, she lists it as 20 to 30 SPF. Um, I think Sin and Teresa will speak to what they learned about listing SPF, but I would probably just say this is a moderate level of sun protection. So I'll update this recipe on the website so it includes that. And Deborah, we ha have a question. Are the SPF factors cumulative? It sounds like they are to get up to that 20 SPF. Yes, yes they are. And what's the difference between the zinc oxide and the titanium oxide? Well, from what I read, zinc oxide provides a little bit stronger protection from UVB and 
I mean, it's a slight advantage to titanium dioxide. Um, so I think you can use them interchangeably, but the zinc, you know, had a slight, slightly stronger track record. Great, thank you. Also, I'll mention that you want to make sure that you do not have nano um, particles, which can go into the skin. So you have the larger particles. Thank you, Teresa. I list that on the recipe. You can, you want to avoid at all costs the nano particle zinc oxide. It's it's really really dangerous to use. And I mean, I, I we couldn't even get it here. So I don't. I think that that's it's worth mentioning. But pay attention to that. There is a note in the recipe when you add the zinc oxide to just be careful breathing around it. I mean put a mask on or turn your head or, or just be mindful that you don't want to inhale that powder. So Deborah, did you mention where you purchased the supplies? I might've missed that. Here's the I got all the supplies except for the zinc oxide and the raspberry seed oil at the grocery store. Oh, good. Um, the zinc oxide and the raspberry seed oil came from a local store here in Boulder called Rebecca's Herbal Apothecary on Spruce Street. Sweet, mm -hmm. sweet little store that has a ton of workshops and, and a, uh, so many products you can't even keep track. So, and all and both these were just on the shelf. We, we also use bulkapothecary.com and Mountain mm -hmm. Rose Herbs for online purchasing. And there's a question, do you have an image of the paperboard tube you're referring to as a container applicator? And is that what we what it would be called if they tried to find it online shopping? Yes, I was gonna grab a photo from Tracy. Yeah, they, oh good, I'm glad you have it. Yes, perfect. Yep. It's just um, a push-up tube you can push up from the bottom and, um, and it all goes in my recycling or in the fireplace when I'm finished with it. Whoops, and you can see my this is just a, a, a salve for my skin every morning and night that I use. Uh, and that's I go through. A really, that's a, such a nice way to do it. And yeah. so I put mine in a jar and you can see the, I'll take the lid off. And you can see that it's kind of a, a thicker consistency. And it sets up really, really well in the jar. So I have it just in a glass jar with a lid. And usually I use an applicator, so I'm not putting my dirty fingers in there, but I didn't have one handy. Um, and I just dig some out and rub it on. I keep, I actually put mine in two jars and I keep it by two different doors that I go out of when I go out to garden or beekeep. And it's really helped me remember to put sunscreen on. It's, it's been helpful. So it's nice to have it in a cute little jar if it's sitting out like it is in my house. But Deborah, would this get contaminated with like bacteria from your face if you're rubbing the sunscreen on or because there are preservatives in the, like if you use uh, lavender essential oil, it helps yeah. um, kill bacteria. So that would be an option. Um, I, I mean, uh, for all intents and purposes, if it's just one person using it and you're not passing it around, I think it's, I think it's going to be used up before you have to worry about it becoming a bacterial problem. Okay. Um, yeah. That would be my thought on that. Yeah. I'll just add also that those are so useful if you're out on the hiking trail or mm -hmm. if you're on the ski slope or something, you can just have that. It can be lip, lip balm or it can go all over your face and go on the tops of your hands when you're hiking so where you need that little extra protection. And that having it in the paperboard tube has been really handy. Yeah, yeah, don't forget to put sunscreen on your lips because I think that's like one of the, you know, problem cancer spots from sun. Yeah. Tracy, do you know if those paperboard tubes are available at Rebecca's? No, they're not. Oh, and you I have, have to order them? them? Yeah, I have to yeah. order them. Um, I've, had them. I've found them before at Michael's. Or oh, at Michael's, Michael's yeah. Crafts? Yeah, yeah it's, Michael's it's, Crafts. It's a rare find but i bet you can yeah so and so you call it paperboard um tube or paperboard lip balm uh paperboard lotion tubes is okay what i found it at and it is Great. like a um 
it is like a paperboard lipstick. We've used um, this cardboard tubes also for lip balms as well, just to be more environmentally friend friendly. So they're a little bit wider than a normal lip balm tube. Well, you can you can get narrow ones too. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. And so yeah. my recipe was a salve based recipe, which is the firm one. And Cynthia and Teresa took a workshop on lotion based um, sunscreen recipes. So they're going to share a couple of other different recipes. And, and Deborah, you had a question about um, adding scent with essential oils. And, and I do see that in your recipe right here. So you yep. can. Okay. And you probably chose lavender because it's soothing to the skin. And but you could do Rose I did. Only because it's a personal favorite, but I mean, whatever scent is appealing, you yeah. you could add it in as as long as it's not you know harmful to skin. Some of them don't do well directly on skin, but like this, I wouldn't put citrus in there. Right. And, yeah, rose would be nice, but it's expensive. Okay. So on to Cynthia. Hi, um, you're going to talk. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the lotion sunscreen ingredients. Um, Cynthia and I were able to go to a workshop at Rebecca's Apothecary and learned how to make lotion sunscreen. And it's really smooth and beautiful. Um, it isn't as heavy or, or maybe as waterproof as Deborah's. Um, but here are some of the ingredients that we put in the sunscreens. There are some ingredients that are better for the face and others for the body. The avocado oil is super rich and heavy and it is good for body, but I, we wouldn't put it on the face because it does clog pores. Um, the almond oil is used on, um, in the body as well, shea butter as well. Jojoba oil is a facial uh, sunscreen product that we used in our foundation um, mineral sunscreen um, foundation that we also put in some pinches of iron oxide. Um, I put in six into, into this full recipe, um, but you can use nine to 12 of the iron oxide. My skin is a little too dark actually for this this color when I put it on it's it's too light for me and so I would use something darker thanks to my Mediterranean um, Bel Belgian grandfather I've got darker skin <laughs> and um, aloe vera is very soothing in in recipes mostly for after um, and after uh, sunscreen or been in the sun for sunburns and then as Deborah was saying, the zinc oxide, titanium oxide, I've used combinations and that's an, an important ingredient as well as raspberry seed oil and carrot oil. And Cindy, do you have anything else to add? Um, I don't think so for this. I think, um, yeah, it's just really important to know for lotion making that you keep your water part and your oil part separate. And it's also important to know what's an oil and what's a water. Like for instance, aloe vera is not oil-based, it's water-based. So you would put that in your water part. Mm -hmm. And you always will add the zinc oxide or titanium dioxide at a later point oh. um, for the emulsification. But we'll get into um, the emulsification, I think with the next slide, maybe. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we were just um, showing you that first video, which was talking about measuring out and showing measuring out um, the parts on a, on a kitchen scale. So in that picture, you can see the type of kitchen scale that we use. And um, you ha it's important to make sure if you're making a small recipe that your kitchen scale is going to go down to a low enough um, measure so that you can actually get accurate measuring. And it is really important to accurately measure your recipes. You can't just throw a bit in, throw a bit in. My daughter has done that before and it, you, it really doesn't come out very well. So be precise with your measurements and, um, and do your, for the lotion part, you measure all of your oil parts and you measure all of your water parts separately. And then you heat them up in a double boiler or that homemade double boiler, which is 
basically just two um, measuring cups, Pyrex measuring cups in water, and you want the water to go about halfway up the measuring cup, and, um, and you melt them, you can melt them simultaneously in one pot, or you can do them separately in two different pots. And, and it's important to have a thermometer handy also to measure the temperature because if you want the emulsification process to work really well, you want the liquids to be about the same temperature, like within five degrees. And it's and, much easier if you have two thermometers. Yeah. One for the water part, one for the oil part to keep them even, the temperatures. Yeah. Yeah, and also we learned in our class, it's really important to keep your utensils separate too. So you don't want to have your oil stir stick going in with your water and vice versa. So you have like two different sets of things. And if you do this, if you set yourself up well at the beginning, it's really easy and it's not going to be complicated at all when you do it in practice. And, and our directions are very clear. On our website, we have a couple of the... Um, of the recipes, one's mineral sunscreen foundation, and the other is a hydrating body um, sunscreen lotion. So they're very clear on how to prepare them. And you can too. So with it. the lotions also, I wanted to say that most lotion recipes that you'll come across have um, emulsifying wax exclusively. And mm -hmm. that makes it, makes it really easy to whip it all together, but we wanted to use our natural beeswax. And so we've been experimenting a little bit back and forth. And you can go up to a ha at least half beeswax and probably a little more than half beeswax to emulsifying wax in your recipe. And it will still whip up beautifully, especially if you use a wand blender like we have in this slide. Um, I had this in my cupboard for making soup and I never use it for soup and I was thinking, what do I have this here for? And it's the perfect tool for emulsifying lotions. And um, it works like a dream. So you could probably even do 100% beeswax if you have one of those wands and you actually really whip it um, well. That's the key is to, to whip it together so that it's emulsified, the oil and the water emulsifies or mixes together and will hold together for mm -hmm. the long run. So Cynthia, I have a quick question. So most lotions that have like water, it, it, lotions uh, like by definition are water and oil emulsified. Mm -hmm. they, they have e-wax in them, the emulsifying wax. Mm -hmm. And it's not very, it's not as healthy for your skin as say beeswax, is that right? Yeah, they do also make um, an eco emulsifying wax. It's supposed to be more biodegradable, I guess, and better for your skin. Um, but yeah, that would be the reason why you would want to go all beeswax if you don't want to have any emulsifying lotion or wax in your lotion. Okay, and I noticed your hand here has like a white um, ghostly look to it. Is that how we're going to look after? And then there's a nice, uh, like a, a kind of a, that must be your titan, that must be your iron oxide to make it colored a little bit. So let me explain that. I just barely put it on. So this is the lotion. So I don't know if you can see. It's hard to get it in front of the, the thing. But it's it's still pretty thick. Yeah. And if you want it to be thicker, you put more beeswax. If you want it to be thinner, you put less beeswax. That's basically a thing. So I, when I took that picture of my hand, I just put a little on and I barely smeared it in. So okay. it's white. I mean, that's what titan titanium and zinc... Um, dioxide, it's a barrier. So it's not a type of lotion that's supposed to sink really in and get into your body. The whole point of this type of sunscreen is that it does sit on the surface of your skin and it doesn't sink in. So I put that on my hand and it starts out white. I already had some on my hand. So it's, and, and the more you can adjust this yourself, the more of the zinc or titanium you put, in your recipe, the whiter it's going to be. And that's right. why you we can't tell you exactly how much SPF it's going to be because we don't know how much you're going to put on your skin. We don't know how well you're going to rub it in. Mm -hmm. uh, but now it, it kind of has rubbed in. And, 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 then, and then, oh, I have a foundation yeah. right here. 
And so putting that on, it still looks pretty light on my skin, as I said, but you know, you rub it in and I wear this on my face every day and it doesn't turn me white. No, but yeah. if you wanted to increase the SPF, just add more of that titanium dioxide or zinc oxide. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. The, the whiter you are, probably the better protected you are. Yeah. Yeah. So don't be afraid to look ghostly. No. And also another thing that's a really good point is just remember to reapply sunscreen. Mm -hmm. After a couple of hours being outside, you just you just always want to reapply, reapply, reapply. Mm-hmm. So we have the recipes for the moisturizing body sunscreen and also a the foundation that has the, the iron oxide for your face on our website. And um, it's under the how to section. And you can just click through and see other recipes if you're interested in those. Sin, I have a question for you. If you left, it just sounds so yummy and smooth. If you left the zinc or titanium out, would you oh, use definitely. that just as a body yeah. lotion? It's really nice. And yes. if you want to show that little video, you can show me blending it all in. And you put the titanium diet, so you put the, the heat up, the oil and the water part, you take the temperature, you blend them together. It's really mm -hmm. nice if you have two people doing it because you can start blending yeah. it with the emulsifying blender and slowly pour the oil into the water or vice versa mm -hmm. and whip it all up. And then once you have it pretty well combined, then you add in the powder, which would be the titanium or the zinc, and then you blend it again. And, and you want to just blend it till it's very emulsified. And then you can use a spatula mm -hmm. at the end to clean through and, um, and then it's, it's, it really, I'm literally this time lapse goes in 32 seconds or something, but it really only takes you about seven minutes to do it in real time. So let's see if it'll run, but you can see I have the thermometer there that, um, it's just a candy thermometer. There's lots of different types of thermometers that you can use. Um, and I like these use definitely use a hot pad if, if, um, because they'll get hot those those glass containers will get hot and that little blue bowl in the front has um, beeswax in it that i thought okay here goes the titanium and then i am blending it up also you need to get that really blended in well but once you get it mostly blended you can just stir it up with a spatula and it starts out um, much more liquidy than it is after it cools. And you wanna make sure to wait for your lotion to cool before you put the lid on. Um, and that way it'll, it'll just be better for you. Would you like me to run it again? And just yeah, it was only at 30 seconds. Let's see it again. Okay. So you have and also the, the zinc, di the titanium dioxide or the zinc oil. dioxide will also thicken your product so keep that in mind as well if you want it to be a little bit thicker or thinner you can adjust that for that reason that's so nice that you can heat both pyrex containers at the same time mm -hmm. in your, your pot here and one little tip to know it seems like the um, water portion does heat up a lot faster than the oil portion so mm -hmm. you don't you could take the water portion out when it gets to the right temperature and the right temperature is on the recipe, but you want it to be about around 140 to 150 degrees. And mm -hmm. you don't want to heat your lotions up past 180 degrees as a general rule. And so when you take it off, then you want to um, take the temperature on each one again before you emulsify it. Because if one cooled down too much, you need to heat that up a little bit more. So, and just so what, happens if, what happens if you're off? Like what happens if you're not that precise? They don't uh, emulsify too well together. So uh, in order for them to bind, they should be about five degrees apart at the most. Uh, so you'd have like a separated lotion. Mm -hmm. but uh -huh. it's not that doesn't stick together. It's okay. separates yeah. oil and water again. And it is good to do two people. Sin, Sin and I did it together and it was much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> We could measure and take the temperature and say, oh, it's time and combine them. So it was fun.
And Sin, did you say that your immersion blender is now dedicated to lotion making? You can't use it in the kitchen again? Oh, no, no, it's perfectly fine. Every bit of ingredients that we have in our recipes, you could basically eat them if you wanted to. They're not. Oh, they're not. perfect. And so, yeah, you just clean it just, off. And you yeah, it. wipe it off. Okay, great. Because so sometimes just, we end up with dedicated craft it, it just has such a little amount of wax in it that it doesn't matter that much because it's okay. only a half an ounce of wax total. Oh, wow. Okay, perfect. It's mostly water based. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's our demonstration. Well, were you going to speak to the mineral sunscreen foundation? It's it's same, sure. similar recipe, but mm -hmm. it is. Um, I had talked a little bit about the jojoba oil, which is great for the face, and the raspberry seed oil, which has a, a lot higher um, SPF. You don't put that much in, um, but in this one, in this case, you do. You put in a, a whole ounce of the raspberry seed oil, which is $5, but it's still, I think, um, you know, economical for making a whole batch of sunscreen um, because it, 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 it's about 10 ounces in total, which is a pretty big bottle or several little jars. Um, and the emulsifying wax, I only put in uh, 1.5 of the shredded beeswax because I wanted to make sure it was super creamy for the face since this is a facial product. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's a combination of the zinc oxide and the titanium oxide. As Tracy mentioned, you can put a lot more in if you want to. And you can put more in to make it you know, more um, higher SPF. And you can also then put in more of the uh, iron oxide, this product, just a little pinch, you know, from anywhere between nine to, to 12 um, pinches. Teresa, and then- is, um, is it just called um, brown iron oxide? Cause there's a couple different colors. Um, this one is brown. Brown iron oxide. Trial and error, you just keep adding a little more until you get the color. It's better than the red just because it's a little bit more of a range of na of natural skin tones would be the brown. For us, yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so then you put in, I put in this, it's called, uh, if I can say it right, lucidal, lucidal, liquid. Lucidal, yeah. Lucidal, that's it, lucidal. <laughs> Um, and it is a natural um, preservative. And so that helps the uh, sunscreen to last longer. And we keep our sunscreens that are natural in the refrigerator. Oh, good point. And we also apply them with like a spoon or a popsicle stick or something that, so you don't get bacteria inside of the sunscreen. And the rest and of it is just you know, the directions that Cynthia already described on how to make it. And, and I would just add that if you put it in the, in the refrigerator, it should last about a year. Mm -hmm. so. how, how long would it last if, you're, if, you're, if you don't have it refrigerated? A month, maybe? At least. I think it would last longer than that. But. I think a couple months, probably. Yeah. But, OK. Mm -hmm. OK. Thanks. So do we have any questions? We I'll do have a few add, uh, Sorry, I'll just add that I store my leftover oils in the fridge too. Yes, absolutely. So and you, you won't use all your ingredients. So it's really handy if you have a back corner of the fridge that you can stash everything away. It really, it really helps keep everything fresh for longer. Yeah. From what we learned at our workshop, you don't need to store the essential oils in the fridge, but everything else. The almond oil, the yeah. you know, jojoba oil, carrot seed. So how long do you think the sunscreen lasts on your skin? I mean, I know it varies if you're outside sweating versus in a nice shady nook. Our, we heard that it lasts about two hours is a good rule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say two hours. And mm -hmm. then reapply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, Cynthia, you mentioned that it's safe to eat. Do you think it's also safe to use on kids? Um, I really have no idea. I think so, but I am not an expert. Does anyone else know? Tracy, do you know that? Well, I think if it's safe enough to eat, it would be fine on kids. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it can be um, um, 
irritating to the skin, but it's such a low concentration. And, you know, my daughter's allergic to calendula essential oil. So mm. you have to test it. They, they should not just sit and eat it, though. That is not recommended. <laughs> okay. I didn't mean to say you should eat it. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, I think people need to test, you know, I test a small patch because especially since we're adding, you know, the raspberry seed oil, and the, those are some unusual ingredients. It's probably smart to test a little patch, even on adult skin and make sure you're good with it. Sure. And you had mentioned that, that some, you wouldn't put essential oils that contain citrus. Um, what other, oil, what other essential oils for the scent would you recommend? You've got rose use and lavender you mentioned. Um, I love, um, oh, what is it called? I have it growing out here. Um, geranium, rose scented geranium. Mm. I know that. It's also calming to the skin. Um, and I like rosemary. Um, and, oh, do you guys have some favorites? I mean, well, let me just tell you about the citrus, Kathy, because we lived in Mexico for a couple of years. We have four daughters and they decided when they were in a swimming pool to make their own sunscreen. And so they had aloe vera because there was an aloe vera plant and there was a lime tree. So they took all those um, ingredients and mixed them together and put it on the skin and they got blisters. Oh no with a combination of chlorine and lime, it was a terrible thing. So never use citrus in a sunscreen. Yeah, ouch. Mm -mm. Um, and so chamomile is a, is a calming uh, chamomile essential oil. Um, there's German chamomile and another one, and they, they're a little different in how they affect your skin. But those both of those, if you have like rosacea or irritated skin, you might try adding some essential oils for soothing soothing your irritated skin. Mm -hmm. And I think they said at Rebecca's that chamomile uh, oil should be kept in the fridge. Okay. Okay. Any questions? I think, unless Celine, you've got another question. I think that answers all of our questions so far. Oh, we've got, what oil scents are your favorite specifically to pair with beeswax scent? Oh. Um, well, lavender for me, hands down. Yeah, this is rose geranium and um, rosemary together. And then, yeah, lavender, actually I've used lavender with orange essential oil um, for, for my body, um, this um, body salve. And if it's low concentrations, it works just fine. Um, but the other thing about citrus oils, they're one of those oil essential oils that don't last. The smell dissipates like after a month it, using this tube, I can only smell the lavender and the, the citrus is gone, the orange citrus. I think we're talking about high concentrations, but I think any low concentrations of scents that you like will probably be fine as long as you test it too. Any other favorites? I really love lemongrass um, mm. mixed with mint. And that I would put in the salves. I love that on cooling on your lips or face, like when you're really out hot or on your hands for hiking. Um, oh, that's true. Lavender is a mint. Lavender is a mint. Rosemary is a mint. And then there's spearmint and wintergreen and um, all of those other kinds of minty things. But I wouldn't recommend putting that close to your eyes. Don't put that mint lotions right by your eyes because right. that can be here. I'm glad you brought that up, Cynthia, because some people might be familiar with Burt's Bees um, lip balms, and those are warming to your lips because it's peppermint essential oil that's in there. Mm -hmm. So we do that to ours so it feels like it's um, medicinal and it's treating. And we eucalyptus oil is also really good for the salves for your lips and hands. Um, and it's a very um, um, intense smell also if you want to get the real minty feeling add a little eucalyptus and rosemary are the strongest yeah. minty um, i like rosemary i like clary sage oh. it's a lovely scent um.